Hello and welcome to my YouTube on life cycle costing. Life cycle costing is in the advanced costing part of the syllabus and is only tested in section A and B. We're going to be looking at a section B question called Midhurst Company. Now remember section B questions have a little case study and then there's five MCQs for you to complete, two marks each. So here's the scenario. Midhurst Company manufactures air conditioning units. It's considering an investment in a new unit for modern offices. So here we have the first question and it concerns the stages of the life cycle. On the left, you'll see that I have the diagram life cycle of a product. We go through development, introduction, growth, maturity and decline. And at each point, there is a different level of sales revenue and a different level of profit. But over time, we are going to cost our product up. So it gives us a positive profit over its life cycle, not by period. So question one says, according to the life cycle costing method, which two of the following statements regarding the stages of life cycle are true? So here are the options. Remember, we need to pick two. Option A, at the introduction stage, further capital expenditure will be needed as production capacity will need to increase to meet demand. Yes, at the introduction stage, it's mainly dominated by fixed costs as we increase our capex. So that's true. B, the maturity stage occurs when the market has reached its saturation point and bought enough of the product. Now you may think that is true, but take a look at the diagram. We haven't reached saturation point. We're not going into decline at maturity. We're selling at the top of the market. We're selling at the highest revenue point. It's our cash cow at that point. So that's not true. That would be when we're going into decline, when we've reached saturation point. Option C, the majority of a product's life cycle costs are determined by decisions which are made at the design and development stage. This is absolutely true. All those decisions made at design and development will determine most of the costs of the product because it will determine how it's manufactured, what functions are in it, whether it's a top quality product, whether you're going to have to use top quality materials and therefore costs would go up or whether you're going to be using more standard materials. So C is true. Option D, the growth stage, when sales have reached a peak and become stable will be the most profitable stage. No, the most profitable stage is at maturity. If you look at the diagram, you can see the sales revenue and the profits are both high at that point. So our answers are A and C. Question two says, calculate the life cycle cost per unit. So this is a calculation question rather than a discursive question. So you need to understand the technique for calculating the life cycle cost. Let's have a look at the information. Midhurst Company expects to sell 10,000 units over the predicted five year life cycle of the unit. So you've been given the total number of units. You haven't been given, as in some questions, the number of units for each of those five years. The finance director has just prepared the initial costings for the unit as follows. So we have all the costings now, which relate to those five years and those 10,000 units. The trick here is some of them are fixed and some of them are variable. The trick here also is to notice that they're in round thousands. So those research and development costs are not 6,200, they're 6,200,000. ,200 and that variable production cost per unit is 42,000, not 42. So we're now ready to calculate the life cycle cost per unit. 
So first of all, we need to separate out the fixed costs. So here the fixed costs are, we've separated them out and I've put them in dollars. So if you add those down, that comes to 357,345,000 for the whole 10,000 units. We now look at the variable costs and again, you separate out those out in dollars and they add up to 55,000 per unit. Now there's no need to times those by 10,000 and then add them to the fixed costs and then divide by 10,000. That's a process you don't need to do on this question. We simply divide the fixed costs by 10,000 units and therefore get 35,734.5 per unit. We add the 55,000 per unit to that and the answer is 90,734.50. We're now on to question three. It says, what would be the revised material cost per unit? The production director has suggested the following change for the costing of the new unit. He's basically saying that the, currently the material costs are 20% of the variable production costs per unit. Now remember those variable production costs per unit were 42,000. One of the materials used is stainless steel. This is budgeted at 2,000 per unit, but an alternative corrosion resistant metal costing 25% less can be used. The production director then believes that a 15% discount can be negotiated for the remainder of the materials. Let's have a look at how we're going to do this question. So, first of all, we have the 42,000 and the material cost is 20%, so that would be 8,400. 2,000 has a discount of 25%. So, 2,000 times by 75% will give you 1,500. The remainder is 8,400 minus that 2,000, which is 6,400. That has a discount of 15%. So timesing that by 85% means we get 5,440. We now simply add them together. So the total is 6,940. That was quite straightforward as long as you followed the information carefully. And this is half the battle with these questions. The calculations are normally very easy but it's all about understanding the information. So follow the process, because if you get a question like this, this is how you should do it. Now we're on to question four. This question is a trick question. It says, at what stage of the life cycle is the new unit most likely to undergo product development? Now, you want to automatically put introduction because that would be the start of the process. Development isn't there, which would be the obvious answer. But the problem is you needed to have read the information. And if you look at the information before the question, it says the production director has also asked about the implications for production planning if the company wishes to extend the product's life cycle. The time at which we would extend the product's life cycle is not at the introduction or growth stage. It would be at the maturity stage. So you needed to read that little bit of information first before you then went ahead and ticked that answer. So the answer is maturity, and that's because we're undergoing product development to extend the product's life cycle. So we're now on the final question of this case study. Question five, which of the following statements relating to the advantages of life cycle costing are correct? Number one, it draws management's attention to all costs related to a product, which other costing methods usually treat as period costs. Yes, it includes all those development costs, it includes all those capex costs. It doesn't treat them as period costs like other costing methods. It focuses on measuring a product's costs from concept to withdrawal, 
rather than reviewing it on a period by period basis. Absolutely, the concept costs are there, the research and development, and the withdrawal costs are there as well, decommissioning them. So it's absolutely true, one and two. Number three, it focuses on what customers are prepared to pay for a product and establishes cost budgets based on an expected selling price. No, it doesn't do that. It establishes a cost based on a life cycle. The price can change throughout that life cycle. So it's not based on an expected selling price. That would be target costing. Thank you for watching my YouTube on life cycle costing. It's certainly not as easy as you thought, but hopefully now you can see a way through. Good luck with the exam.